Let's see. Okay, well, it's gonna let me record right now, so that's good. Okay, are you guys layering up? Is it still chilly? It feels chilly to me, so I have on a turtleneck and a dress. But anyway. Um, let's go to the modules for a minute and we'll talk about midterm. Wait a minute. Let's just let's just stop doing that. How's your weekend? How you doing? Good? Yeah, good. Colby's in this. Anybody? Yeah, good. Guys, tell me who of you are in Santa Barbara City College Stories, our next production. I'm waiting to hear from Maggie. I think she wants to uh, Zoom me this week. Okay. And has anyone else heard? Yeah. Uh, me as well. I called her yesterday. Yay. Okay. Super. So we have Stephanie and Sue likely and Colby and anybody else? Did anyone else send in a story? Good. Well, we'll look forward to seeing you. This will be a very interesting experiment because this is a play that is really, it's a collection of stories under three themes as Kit said yesterday, last week. <laughs> and uh, so we're just working out, we've had our first production meeting, so we're just working out how it's actually all gonna work. Of course, we're waiting on our COVID numbers so that we can figure out exactly where our filming location is going to be and how that's going to work. So we will be, uh, I'll be having a design meeting with Maggie today. We'll be talking about individual stories, what the look might be for those. And then I'll be working with the actors individually to determine looks. And in this particular situation, we'll be working out of their own wardrobe. It's, it's one of the few times when we would do that. So one of the reasons we would do that is because with this particular production, unlike Thin Man, where we'll have multiple filming days, this will be one filming day. They're reading, really it's a story and the reader is usually the author. So they are, they are relating something, a personal experience about themselves. So that makes it closer to them one of the reasons we can use our own clothing and also because it's a one time only. They're not gonna be crawling around on the stage. There's nothing to be missing from home to get to the stage. One of the reasons we provide clothing and we do that elaborate check-in, check-out dressing list thing is because actors don't bring everything from home every time. And if we have them bringing certain things, for example, you saw on the dressing list that they may be bringing their own foundation garment, for example, then that would be labeled and it would stay in the dressing room and it would not travel back and forth with the actor because if we're doing multiple rehearsals and multiple performances, the likelihood of that garment not arriving on the day that you need it is fairly great. So we would have a uh, you know, we would show them that we've indicated that we are going to be holding that as actors own. It has their label in it. We would be, costumes would be responsible for the maintenance, repair, the washing of those items. The reason why you do that is inevitably, you know, you end up with the guy who bring, who's wearing white socks, does not bring the black socks, and he's wearing a black business suit. The woman wearing a black bra, wearing a white sheer blouse, and then we're seeing that underneath. So it's just a preventative measure. But in this case, it's gonna be a one and done. So we will see them. They will come, hopefully, uh, we'll, uh, I will send them images of what would be ideal for their character. We'll talk through items. They will take a picture of what they have or we can zoom and they'll, what we did before is they can lay them out on their bed and then they can try them on, take a selfie. We will also do a, consultation with a makeup person. So the makeup person for this one will be Ida and she's going to be zooming people and then we'll be able to she'll, she'll be able to zoom prior to 
the rehearsal and the performance to make sure that your makeup in, is correct. So she'll be providing a makeup schematic for you. So that'll be kind of fun. And it's a way that we can work in this remote way, but you get full support. And <clears throat> if of course there's something that the director and I both feel like you really need and you don't have it, then we'll provide it. So there's absolutely, that's still the option. But I just thought it'd be interesting because we have three people in our class that will be participating and uh, we'll be doing it a very different way. This is actually different than how we did Antigone. Antigone, which I shared the, um, <coughs> excuse me. Antigone, I shared the uh, dressing list for, hold on a minute. So um, sorry, the chairs were moving and it was just too loud for me. Okay. I've completely lost where I was because of those chairs moving around. You're talking about Antigone. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, so this is different than how we did Antigone and I shared those lists with you in that we actually took a photograph of the character. We did the check-in, check-out list. That was pl actually placed on a garment bag, checked in as the garment went into a garment bag. The actor signed out the clothes with this check-in, check-out list on the garment bag and the photo so that the actor got dressed according to the photo. The actor then, when they returned the clothes, checked the garments back in to their garment bag and then return them to Santa Barbara City College. So, you know, every time we're doing something, we're doing something a little bit different. And that's kind of the, that's the way that it works in costume. Okay, uh, let's talk about this week and then I'll publish it this week. So this week we're gonna have the midterm and I wanna show you the midterm study guide so that you can look at that. This week I, I am hoping on Wednesday we'll have a guest speaker who is a fashion designer and she has was um, very successful in the fashion world. So that will be very fun for us to have her. We're gonna be discussing, today we'll be discussing research and we'll be doing a color media lab so that we work with our color media and try and try and make the shapes that we wanna see. And I believe, and what we'll do is I'll dress up a mannequin and we'll first draw from the mannequin and then we will color on top of that so that you can see what does color media do, okay? Let's do a screen share. Sorry, I'm not ready to do that. I apologize. So here's our under information here, which is the first slot you'll see. This is the... Um, where you'll find the course overview and where our weekly topics are listed. So this week, as I just uh, talked about, today we're going to have our midterm, which will be offline. We're going to be doing a drawing lab today from, and we'll be drawing and doing color media. And we'll talk about research images, how to look at them in detail. And then we, you can, uh, look at a change list by character. So that is if the character needs more than one costume change. And then our guest artist on Wednesday will draw from a mannequin, both male and female will dress 
and I'll dress them in clothes that will be reminiscent of the period in which you are working with for Lion in Winter. Okay, let's look at the midterm study guide. I just wanted to see on here. Okay, so our uh, line in winter is due on April 4th, okay? So you can see that's right here, line in winter, and then we'll go right on to the final project overview. Sorry for the whole scrolling screen thing. I have made the line in winter page. That's, it's just Lion in Winter design project. Here's our whiteboard discussion. Here is a grading rubric for Lion in Winter. <clears throat> and you can see that each of the things that we talked about, it has a checklist, historical folder, dressing list, color renderings, cross plot, or organizational tool, however you're organizing the script, rough sketches for each character and concept statement. So the oral presentation, and I will flesh out each one of those if that we have discussed that in class, but I will get one page so that you can talk about, it'll be about presentation. We have the oral presentation and then your participation. We'll set up a discussion for that so that you can uh, have a discussion regarding each of the designer's work. The visual presentation, it needs to have a strong impact, clear, readable, meaning we can read the sketch, color rendering, it's exciting to look at, strong character, those are exemplary, that would get you full points. And then you will have a score here on yours for the points that you get. Each one of these things is, is a five point entry, your rendering technique, and we're, that's what we're gonna be working on today and Wednesday, we'll be working on it a lot of times through April 5th, so that's about a month get this project together. The growth of skills. So I have looked at what you've done so far, how we're, you guys are all making great progress. That's why you need to continue drawing every single day. And deadline met, did you meet the deadline of having it done on April the 5th? So that's the, um, that's the rubric for line in winter. And then underneath this, let me see if I can go to the previous and that'll be faster. Underneath this, this is our whiteboard discussion, the rubric I added on the next page. No, okay, let me just get to modules. I thought it would get me to the high heading, but underneath the line in winter project will be all of the elements in discussion pages for presentation, um, rendering, and all the the different things that we work on, unless we've already discussed the Mondasium and I'm not gonna continue them there, okay? Questions so far? Uh, let me show you the midterm study guide. Did any of you look at it? So here it is, this is basically a, um, the salient points from each of the chapters that we've gone through that we've discussed in class and in your book. So the Ingham and Covey book, the designer costume designer's handbook, uh, chapter one, the play script. Here's the things that we've talked about with that. What is the cross plot or action chart? What is the play's theme? This is the this is a critical thing. Remember, we discussed that. We discussed that in terms of line and winter. Okay, the production, organization. How can the cross plot help you? What does it do in a design meeting? What is a rough cross costume plot? So this is a terminology thing that is in the book that we talked briefly about. What is a dressing list? How does the designer use a dressing list? Okay, what is the period style and style? So how is that determined by in a play? What is the production book? List 10 elements usually contained in the production book. Costume research. What kind of historical information is important for a designer? We're gonna be working on research and how to look at details today. 
we did look at those with our swatching um, project. So that was excellent. And that helped you understand, I hope, how to take apart certain kinds of things and what might be um, a signature detail. And we're gonna talk about that in a breakout room today. We're gonna to talk in small groups about Lion and Winter. What are research notes? What is primary resource? What is a secondary resource? And then we talked quite a bit about preliminary sketching and layout. What is necessary in drawing the human figure first? The line of the figure, the proportion of the figure. What are the elements of design that you can use, which we discussed? And then swatching. What do swatches represent? How can swatches inform the character drawing? Questions so far? Uh, yes, uh, I was a little late. Just need a little recap on uh, um, on uh, I don't know what, what, on what uh, you you were talking about. Hey Diego, you know what? Uh, what I'll I'll give you a quick recap. Just stick with us right now, and then I'm going to stop share right after this, and I'll tell you what we did. Okay. Okay. All right. So the cost, the, the Laver book, and I, it's so funny, I always want to say Rod Laver, but that's a famous tennis player. Um, costume and fashion, of course, a history, a concise history, chapter one, how it began. Why do humans wear clothing? Early materials for clothing, hide, how's it made pliable, furs, bark, animal fibers, vegetable fibers. And then in chapter one, we have wrapped clothing, tunics. These are our vocabulary words, okay? You, we had more vocabulary words. These are the only ones that I would select for the midterm. I will not select anything that's not on this study guide, okay? Chapter two, these are the vocabulary words that you'll be responsible for. And again, these are, we're on our site. So you have those on your redrawings. And um, you, these are all terms that exist in this textbook. I've made sure that each one of these is in the costume and fashion book. Each one of these words is in the costume fashion book in these chapters. So since you're working out of that and you've read those, it should be very straightforward to be able to find them. Now, some words repeat. I'm, I, for example, brooch, girdle, fibulae, these are things that repeat also in early Europe, brooch, right? Kirtle. So these are things that um, uh, Phrygian cap. So I will not say is the Phrygian cap from early Europe or is it from, you know, Greek and Roman. If it's something that repeats, unless I give you a very specific context, then I'm not going to have you de determine what era it belongs to. Some are very clear, okay? So I don't need you to memorize a bunch of stuff inside of a particular category. And remember, this is open book, open note. So if you have your information on here, for example, all of these I'm going to look and see if there's other headgear. So wimple or gorget, barbette, crespian, horned headdress, heart shaped headdress, henan headdress, butterfly headdress, coif. These are all women's head garments, head pieces, and I have not put them in easily categorized order because I want you to have them out of order, which is a training technique so that you can more easily identify them. If I separate everything by men and women and you get used to that, then when you look at it on a quit on a test and it's not in that same familiar relationship, then it might stump you. So that's why things are mixed up here a little bit. Okay. Hood with Lyrope, chaperone, fez, hood with Lyrope, which you know the Lyrope, which is a long stringy thing that's off the back, gets wrapped around the head. The, the hat gets put on over the face hole, becomes a chaperone, which actually looks like a turban. And then Turkish fez, flat cap. These are all men's headgear. Uh, crack house poulains, the long pointy shoes, patents, the, the elevated wooden shoes to keep your feet out of the dirt. So, you know, a lot of these, it looks like there's a lot of 
maybe categories, but for you, it might be best to say, okay, this is headwear, and then list all of the headwear in one category. List all of the major garments, but they're mixed up because on the test, they will be mixed up. They will not follow a linear fashion. Okay, questions about that? Okay, I'm going to now just for um, Diego, I'll just give you a teeny bit of a review about what we did today. We're talking about the midterm. We're talking about this week, what we're doing. So you can find that in the information section, week eight. We'll have a guest speaker on Wednesday. Today, we're going to talk about research. We'll also do a drawing lab and work with color media so that we get used to that. The, we'll draw a mannequin later on Wednesday dressed up in um, clothing that will look like Lion in Winter so that you have an opportunity to actually look at a three-dimensional object and draw from that instead of just drawing from a picture. Uh, the Lion in Winter project is due on April 5th. Remember that's already in your course outline. Um, I will list pages for each of those parts under the Lion in Winter category, which is presentation, participation, and those things based on the rubric. Okay, any okay. questions? so far because what I'd like to do, I wanna talk about a device that is really helpful for determining a character look. And I'm gonna talk about it with you and then we'll go into breakout rooms and I want you to try and figure it out based on your character. We're gonna go into breakout rooms based on character from uh, Lion and Winter, okay? So we have seven characters in line in winter. We'll have, uh, let's see, how many do we have here? Just a sec. Yeah, okay, we're gonna do six breakout rooms. So you're going to get to pick which characters you want before we go to breakout rooms, okay? And what I want you to try and do is figure out what might be a signature detail, okay? Signature detail for the character. And we've talked, we've looked at research, we've looked at details. So what might that be? Sometimes, and I have found this to be a very, very good device for helping the actor get into the character and helping me get into the character and trying to figure out what can you do that with this particular character. Um, there are, uh, there are ways that you can use research for that. There are ways that you can actually use physical objects like talisman that the actor may wear, may carry in their pocket, may have as part of their costume elements that help describe the character. So it can be very helpful to think of characters metaphorically and metaphorically put them into an organic universe, such as an animal kingdom, such as a plant kingdom, an underwater world, or in some other kind of environment that will then distance you from that story and think about what is it about that particular metaphorical image that helps you understand that character. It can drive your research. It can drive your silhouette. It can drive your um, texture and the color that you choose for that character. It can also be an underlying uniform, unifying theme that the audience will never know about, but that everything seems to be tied in based on that theme. Does that make sense to everyone? Does that sound interesting? It may be a different way than you've thought about these characters so far. Because now we've been working with this play for a couple of weeks. So we have a lot of information about the characters. And now we need to sort that out and figure out how can we really illustrate the character in the best way possible. You each have come up with your own concept statement. And those are to be uh, written out and they'll be verbally presented with your, with your sketch, with your rendering presentation. So this is now time to think about how can I tie into that 
with what I know. And sometimes it's beneficial to think of a metaphorical statement before a metaphorical uh, unifying theme before you actually do your research. So sometimes it can be a, an inanimate object, right? If we think about Beauty and the Beast, you know that whole, <clears throat> when the wardrobe comes to life and the teacup and the saucer and the teapot and all that kind of stuff, the candelabra, you know, uh, that is a metaphorical image. And they did that incredibly successfully, but we knew that it was a candelabra and then he became his real person. And it was so interesting to see candelabra person, candelabra person. So think about the kinds of things that might relate here. Alternately, a signature detail can be a costume item. So I was doing a play that was in 1880s. I'm just thinking about this. No, maybe it's a little late, 80, somewhere in there. No, I don't think it was, it definitely wasn't in the 1890s. But anyway, it was um, The Little Foxes by Lillian Hellman. And I had found a really interesting uh, stick pin tie tack for one of the characters that was a pugilist. That's a boxer. And it happened to be a character that was just a little bit aggressive, not very friendly, just like wanting to control things. And it just seemed to fit that character really well. And when I came to the costume fitting and I was talking to Phil about his costumes and he had a lot of changes and then they decided to make a three act play into a two act play and his change had to happen in the middle. It's very tricky. And I, we talked about that little piece and it, he really hung on to that and that became a very important detail and backstory for the actor, okay? So it's just something like that. It sometimes can help you get to a different point. It can also help inform how the character might look. And the audience will never know, but you'll know, the actor will know, and the look of the character will be unified because you have made a very specific choice, not just randomly following some kind of research or some kind of image or some kind of other picture that you may have seen. So what I'd like to do is take some a few minutes and we'll go into breakout rooms. I will, we'll talk about each breakout room will have a character. So let me uh, get that set up. And you will, if we go into this, you know what, I don't want to, I wonder if they set them up the same way each time. Let's try this. What, uh, sorry, um, about signature detail. Do you mean like, uh, like a, um, like a physical trait or like a part of their character, like their? Um, That's what you're going to talk about, Diego. Oh. So I'm going to tell you the rooms and who you're with, and you're going to pick a character. Okay. Let's put the characters on the board so that we can see them. We have Henry. Eleanor, Alice, Philippe, Richard, John, and Jeffrey. Okay. Is somebody dying to, let me see, is that a little bit, are you guys, can you see that okay? Okay. So uh, room one is Diego and Stephanie. Room two is Kit and Sue. Room three is Martha and Sam. Room four is Aspen and Josephine. Room five is Colby and Cassandra. And room six is Kara and Odalis. Have you guys worked together before? No. no. Okay. So you're working with someone okay. new. First of all, do our usual. Aspen, you've worked with your person before? Um, yeah, I believe so. Josephine, have you worked with Aspen? I don't know, actually. I can't remember. <laughs> okay. 
All right, well, let's keep you there for now. So please remember your um, courtesy welcoming. Let's try and get to know a little bit about the person. Uh, let me see, why don't we talk about your favorite color? So introduce yourself, make sure you know their favorite color and then go right into discussing your character and what might be a signature detail, a metaphorical image, something that can help you grab on to the character. In order to adequately have this discussion, you will have had to have read the play pretty significantly and have looked at some of your character research that we discussed. Are they a leading character, a supporting character? What are their relationships to others in the play? What position do they have, okay? So who would like to make a pick first? Just raise your hand. And if you raise your hand, you get to have the pick of the four. Okay, I saw Sue and then Kara, then Colby. So Sue, what do you wanna pick first? I didn't raise my hand, but okay. Oh, you didn't. Okay, very good. Kara. Uh, we'll go for Henry. Okay. And Colby. Eleanor. Okay. Uh, Odalis, who do you want to pick? Um, Philip. Oh, you want to pick Philippe? Okay, great. So we're having two in a group or just one? Two. Oh, okay. There's two in a group, two people right. in a group. Okay. But characters, one character or two characters? One character. Okay, well, sh she's with me. Oh, Odalis, you can't, you, you, you're with, you're doing uh, Henry. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I just picked. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, who else? Come on, folks. You're going to, uh, Martha, what, Sam, Martha and Sam, Diego, who do you want? John. Okay. Diego and your partner will do John. And I'll go. go to, anybody else? Martha and Sam, who do you want? Okay. Are you sending me a chat and I'm not, I've covered it up, hold on. Okay, great. So let me find it, thank you. Sam, you can text me who you want, I mean, or chat. So these are not available. We have Alice, or Alice, Philippe, Richard and Jeffrey. Okay, everyone else is silent. All right. Okay, Martha, you're gonna do Elise, Martha and, and Sam. I didn't see a chat from you, so I'm, I'm picking for you. Aspen and Josephine, you'll do Richard. And let me go down. Yeah. Okay, Colby, Aspen, Martha, Sue. Did you tell, give me one, Sue and Jeffrey? You want to do Philippe? Oh, Jeffrey. Jeffrey. Philippe or Jeffrey? Those are the two left. Jeffrey. They're both good. Jeffrey. Jeffrey. Okay. All right. I'm sending you off. Sorry, Pam. Yes. Yeah, Sam said that she wanted Richard before you, but it's okay. Oh, I see. Okay, so um, then you guys will do Alice, okay? I guess I didn't see it in the chat. So this will be the Sam group, Sam, Martha, and this will be Aspen and Josephine. Okay, is everyone clear on your characters? Off we go, yes. I'll come in and visit. Let's have, we'll do five minutes. You have John. Hello. Hi, yes, you have John as picked by Diego. Okay, perfect. Um, so what I was thinking, Diego, is maybe um, I was reading and I saw that um, I feel John is, uh, he's the more immature one. 
yeah he's he's younger uh, than the rest of the mm-hmm. um uh so yeah he does act like a spoiled brat sometimes in the play and yeah you can see that um right so what um, you want to do is list the character traits you guys could you could each jot them down okay and then you can think about visualizing those okay okay all right i'm gonna go to room three sounds good let me go there and so uh sam you're gonna chat me because your mic's not working i'm in your room one of the things I just said to the other group is uh, list the character traits of your character first. Let me see that. Maybe that's me. Okay, that's fine, Sam. You're going to shift to a new device. One thing that I found when the mic wasn't working is make sure that, you know, if you've turned it off, you can go in and make sure the volume's up in the Zoom recording as well. So, uh, you're with Martha and just hang tight until uh, I get her back in, okay? Oh no. Somehow we lost Martha. Is it working now? Yeah, I can hear you fine, but somehow we lost Martha. So I'm just gonna, were you in room three before? I think so. Okay, well, she'll get back in here. And uh, so you can just list your character traits for Is this like personality or is this like costume? I was breaking in and out for a bit. Personality. You can't list costume before we know personality. Yeah. Okay, so let's break it down to the character first. In other words, it should be organic to the character. We're not putting something on top of the character. Does that make sense? Yeah. It should come out of the character. Okay, I will uh, go back to the main room and see if I see um, Martha. Otherwise, I'll come back and join you as soon as I do somebody else, okay? Okay. Oh. Hello. Snake bracelet then or something. A a really big snake bracelet, something like that. Yeah. Before you talk in individual details, have you talked about the character traits that drive the character? Yeah. Yeah, we've talked great. about like how he's perfect. Protected. Perfect. So, so you- I said it was the slithering guy. He reminds me of a snake because he kind of plays people against each other. That's what I was saying. Okay, great. So you guys can decide. Uh, just just keep going. I think that's great. I have somebody that is uh, has somehow dropped out of a room. So I'm going to try and find oh. her and get her back in. And somebody had to switch devices. So. Okay. See you in a few. Sounds okay. like you're doing great. Thank you. Okay. So here's essays. You know, let me let's look at books. Works of art in the timeline. Select a geographic region. Select a time period. Shall we do that? Here we go, 1000 to 1400 AD. Do we like that? Let's see what they have. This looks kind of familiar. Right, we have a lot of uh, ecclesiastical wear during this period that then reflects. These are showing like heraldic colors dressed up the same. And this is the ascension 
So it is an illuminated manuscript. And this is where we get a lot of imagery. They were very beautifully um, painted. And then these were uh, put into the respective gospel text. So that's part of the Bible. And they're showing you what's happening. So those are things that you can look at. What would that give you? What are some of the things that this kind of image gives you? Look at the line, very vertical. And the, this line, Gothic period, medieval period, reflects the architecture. So we're looking at towers and things that are pointy on top of castles. So the costumes also reflect that. And so does this artwork. And this is just a page. But also look at the incredible color sensibility for it. Look at the geometric pattern that is in, involved here. Look at these curious bird imageries. And let's see if we can go back. I hope I'm not stuck on one thing. Let's go back to how did we get to time period? Here we go. Just have to know how every, every site kind of has different ways you search thing. You just have to find where the time period is, date and era. So see, every time we've clicked on something, it's a little bit different. They have 194 images from here. in this time period. And maybe we can look at, let's see if they're sorting by, let's sort oldest to newest because 1000 is closer to the beginning. So here are some things from 11th and 12th century. So look at that as a necklace you could use. Here is a bowl with incised decoration. You can get a very great color sense or these leaf patterns. This is an incredible, uh, very sensual female imagery. And Buddha imagery, earrings. I think these, it's one of a pair. This is the one side and the other side, you can see how intricate the gold work is. There is a carved doorway. So this might be something that the castle would look like, even though this is Italian, it's in, it, they would have carved it earlier than that even. The running hair, a beautiful uh, color of this golden, dark golden yellow with the ivory. Let's see if we go to 80 results per page what we get so that we can go a little faster. Here we go. Okay, so you can just you can look through and see what what can I get out of this? Here, this is interesting. A histamion, hista, histamion of Constantine. So it's this is a, a like a bas relief. It's a gold em, embossed coin or something. We can see them holding a mace across in the background. You see the elaborate collar or the top part of the garment with a crown. You can see shoulder detailing, a long gown. These are exactly in our time period. And also Western versus Eastern influencing, okay? The filial part, piety is Eastern. These hair ornaments are, look at this uh, filigree pattern in the center. Could that be reflected on a garment? Sure, it can be reflected at, the, at a hem of a garment. It could be reflected where the sleeve connects to the body of a garment a bracelet, figure with a jeweled headdress. So, you know, what are we getting from each one of these details? 
even a chess set with jade and some other stone, maybe malachite. Is malachite green? That would be wrong. I don't know what that would be, but jade on this side for sure. Head of a youth giving you a hairstyle, even a bit of braiding. So you, you're really having to, ah, chapel from Notre Dame. You're really having to look for research. A lot of it will, could be religious iconography, plaque with Christ presenting the keys to St. Peter and the law. Column statue of a king. So there you have a very narrow statue. Let's look up. Let's just go to a different, uh, I can't, I think I have to stop. I'm gonna go to a different, ask a different prompt when you get stuck. And what can you ask? The, um, you wanna avoid that, like you said, Kari, you definitely want to avoid the, um, redrawings and that kind of thing. But sometimes Wikipedia might not be a bad uh, place to start because it might give you some ideas. So let me just take a look. So I, I'm just on, uh, I'm typing in warriors in 1183 Great Britain. And first one that comes up, Richard I of England, Wikipedia, okay? So I'm gonna screen share a couple of things to, for you to look at, which are, here's, here's an effigy. In other words, a death mask of Richard. So you can actually see him, okay? Again, Sometimes the internet gives us wrong information, but this is pretty solid and it's in exactly the time frame we want. Richard is now known as Richard the Lionheart with the heart of a lion, but that is a pretty interesting information. Here's a great seal that he used, so you can take a look at that. And then Geoffrey de Rancon's Chateau. You can look at different pieces of, these are real, uh, pieces of money. Again, Richard in profile, so you can see the hair, the distinct chin, nose, and a part of the collar. You can get some background information about him and when he's anointed king, so this is a bit later. This is Richard meets Philip of France, so this is, ex this again, look at the Time frame. the author has taken a liberty with this particular time frame, putting it in 1183, because probably neither one of those guys would be um, living 70 years later if they're already in their 20s, even in their teens. But a very rich color, and you definitely see two teams here. We see the blue team with the fleur de lis, which is the French pattern. And then we see the red team with Richard the Lionheart. So there's that, that sets up a whole color relationship. And then sometimes there's, there are very specific, let me see if I can go to this app, the previous page that I was at. Can you guys see William Marshall and Knight's Tale? Yes. Yes. Okay. So it starts out with this uh, sideways um, tomb and Here's a great picture of Richard, and this is a, this is probably a repainting. This does not look like an authentic painting to me. And this looks like it was painted much later, like maybe in the 18th century, about what they imagined it would be like. But you can get information off of this because we had that picture of Richard on a horse. They did festoon their horses in this way. He's wearing the armor that we know, the greaves that we had learned about before, the gorget, which comes underneath the chin. 
that actually in the previous, you know, was a woman's garment, then it became a metal garment. The heraldic pattern of this patch, you can see this is the fleur de lis right here, and this is the lion heart. They're putting them together. So this is um, because it's William the Conqueror. Thomas Beckett, this is from Richard King Henry the, the second, right? And you can see their chain mail. And this is the lion heart on front of their um, tabard, their shield. So, you know, how much information can we get from that? The, the elongated lion is definitely the Richard. This is a, who is this? I think it's William. So anyway, but it does give you a very beautiful picture of a crown. And knowing our research, the trim, the brooch, the under tunic, all of these things work with what we know as our research. I'm going to stop this and look up. I have some, see, the other thing is I have some specific costume books that of course you may not have access to, but we can try and look them up, which is, uh, arm and arms and armor. So arms and armor. And that might be a way to look up Richard. How about arms and armor? I put up arms and armor and I have arms and armor of the late medieval world. Let's take a look at that. So you have to be very industrious when you're really trying to look for research. This, this part of research gives you uh, the meaning behind the character. It helps inform the world in which they live. So see, here's late medieval arm and armor. Here's a different one. Here's, let's just take a look and see what they have. Or we can just go back. There's a great uh, suit of armor, really beautiful. All the whole, the things I never sign up for. Okay, let's look at images. And then you have to be careful when you look at images that you make sure, let's see if we can get even earlier than 14th century. Because those are a little bit late. Let's see if we can get some images of this because I don't want you to look at 15th century when really we're in the 12th century. Okay, what I'm gonna look at, now I'm gonna try and look up uh, chain mail. Okay, because I've seen some pictures of chain mail in the uh, research. So now I'm gonna look up chain mail. By the way, uh, chain mail is spelled, let's see how, maybe I'm, maybe I'm spelling it the French way, so, okay. Let's take a look at this. Now, the first thing you get when you get, when it, you research chain mail is you're gonna get all kinds of things that are, you know, here's what you're talking about, Cara. Oh, medieval, this is what it looks like, or, or chain mail, or here's a battle ready from Etsy, and here's this, it's how to knit your own chain mail. Um, and then you have to, then you have to go down the path of what is authentic chain mail because none of this is right and you have to find it so you have to do a different search and it can be this can take you a long way and they're gonna they want me to spell it this way and then you have to say what words are going to help me out here authentic chain mail and then we could look up, okay, that's not gonna help me. Maybe medieval chain mail. Nope, this is reenactment. So I clicked it, I'm gonna not click it. I'm gonna look up museum chain mail. Now these reproductions do give you a quick hit on what would be available. And there's some really cool stuff available that you can actually buy that's, um, that is, plastic molded and then painted to look like armor. 
and you might want to do that for a play. These chain mail coifs are very cool. They're knitted. Some of them are actually chain, but you don't really want chain because it's super heavy. So there's a wide variety of chain mail here. So that's something that you can use to inform yourself. But what I want to do is see if we can find chain mail in museums. So that we find an actual piece of chain mail in the British Museum. There you go. That makes a lot of sense. Here are some images. This is what chain mail actually looked like. Here's a, a suit of chain mail with a round helmet. Three different pieces of chain mail. Chain mail with swords. So this is a tunic, right? A tunic that's split to accommodate movement. This is an, also an authentic piece of chain mail on top of leather probably a breastplate and a shoulder piece. Oh, I didn't want to do that. Dang it. The British Museum is a, is a phenomenal resource. It is incredible. So this says Asia. Technique velvet, I don't know what that technique, but it's metal and skin. We can see the hide here. We can see the metal rings. Let's go back. I can't, I don't know if this is gonna take me to where I was or Okay, excellent. So see, now we're finally on something that really looks like what we wanna see. This is something that is authentic and real. That would be a piece, that's a little bit later piece, but it's certainly worth looking at because it doesn't seem to be Asian, okay? Notice the cod piece of chain mail to protect the genitalia, very important. And then you wanna make sure you're not getting into Asian here we are, chain mail. You wanna stay with the European chain mail. So you'll have to look at that. Now, there's nothing to be said that you couldn't set your piece in Asia, but then you'd need to, everything would have to be uniformly there. Here is a, a coif, which is a hood of chain mail. Also, it says fused with and probably fused with leather. So you see how you can actually go down the road and research and find different things. So now this thing, although you're looking at a fake, can help you draw this because you've actually seen the original and you can use this image as your research. And this is the image that's going to show the director and the actor, this is what it was actually like for this, for this character. Not this super hyper clean, you know, guy, right? So those are some things that are ways to, there's a great, about like a balaclava coif where just the eye holes are cut out. Okay, a tunic of chain mail armor, mail shirt, and then the pieces. Was that helpful? Yes. So it's, it's, you know, it's not that you are going to find it in a second. It's, this is a, not an easy period to research. And if we look up, um, I'm going to just do a basic thing and then I'll go back on here. Like if I say clothing from 1183, and I'll, I'm sure I'll get a bunch of weird, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, this is perfect. <laughs> You'll love this. So the first thing you get is some kind of weird, uh, you know, sportswear. Like, oh, this is a cycling shirt. Very rare. Oh, this is a very rare Laura <laughs> Ashley dress. You know, it's like, okay, this makes no sense. Then down here, we finally get into some cu curious period things. And you're thinking, whoops, sorry. I'm not in the right place. Let's go back to the British Museum and look up, let's see if we can look up. Search. And we can search, look at how many things you can search. Let's search on 
oh, maybe let's see what galleries is like. Maybe they have, uh, boy, those would be some fun um, Greek drawings to make, wouldn't they? Okay, let's look at galleries and see what they are like. Where are they? 60 galleries. And I thought I said enlightenment. Okay, that's a little bit too late for us. So that's not gonna work. Now let's go to some other way we can search the collection. Thank you for letting me know that. Did I misspell it? Probably. Wow, look at this really amazing cross in our exact time period. It's probably worth it to uh, zoom in on that and take a look at these. Sorry, I don't mean to make you seasick. But look at the imagery. I'm gonna try and get it more in the center, like it's going off the screen. I don't, I don't know how to, here we go. It's up in the upper corner, I see it. Sorry, sorry for that. But look at this, you've got the, the you've got a worker in a tunic. So he's gonna be feeding, working with the animals. You've got some incredible gemstone geometric pattern on top of geometric. Jacob, and you're looking at this. So this is actually enameled. And there are very, it's, this maybe you're going to put a cross on one of your characters. There's certainly a lot of religious iconography within this particular play. So it might be something that you want to look at. Let's see what's next. An armulet. Armlet from massive copper cast. So that's on like someone's arm. What? Maybe those look like headphones, medieval headphones. Yeah, don't they? I thought the same thing. I think it's so cool. This part would go under the arm. This part would be on the outside of the arm, right? Let's see what it says. It's a pair. This is too early. Oh, we, we got out of our time period already, see? So this idea of research, it takes a long time. If you really want to do exceptional research, you're going to have to work on some exceptional, in exceptional ways. And you know what I will do though? I will take, you have that your books in your, you know, you have some books in your uh, research books in your handbook, right? Remember in the back, the bibliography? Uh, is this for, uh, is this for the, the thing that's due in April or? or... Yeah, we're all still talking uh, about. Uh, it's homework. We're it's talking about it's the it's line in winter. And these are the kinds of things that you can look at. So there's the Mila, the Mila Davenport is called the Book of Costume. It's a, it's a very large um, collection and that's something that you can look at. So Middle Ages, let's see about that. Uh, I'm looking for one that's exactly in our time period. The, oh yeah, Will, Phyllis Cunningham, the Handbook of English Medieval Costume. Let's see if we can find that. So I'll try and list some books for you to look at, but also just to be, I think that that you can get books online at the, at the Metropolitan Museum of Art and you can look at them for free. So let's, let me just try that and just see. I'm typing in history of costume, Mila Davenport. And just to see if I could get the book online. I just heard about this resource. Oh, this is kind of fun. So, Two things, let's just look at this before I click so that you can see what this is like. So this is the history of costume. I just did history of costume at Davenport Museum of Art. 
So you can look at this um, costume in the Metropolitan Museum of Art essay, High Style, the Costume Society, Miller Davenport Awards, and look at these incredible images that were from different time periods. History of Costume, Miller Davenport, let's see what this is. This is a queer history of fashion. I'm wondering, uh, queer history is a very uh, big movement right now about trying to find what actually was the first, there, it has not been well documented, so it's, we're really trying to document it at the Costume Society. It's very, very interesting. Okay, this is a, um, yeah, this is not a very helpful list. It's like a list of books and chapters. So I will do some research about the um, of books availability at the Metropolitan and see if you actually can download them and look at them and see how that works. And then I will post some, I'll post some, what I think are some great resources for you, both in Arms and Armor. Like I'll post five books and then tell you how to get, tell you how to be able to see them on the Met. Okay. All right, let's take our break. Quite, first of all, questions. Otherwise we're gonna take a break and then I'm gonna set up a drawing so that we can do our color media. Uh, I just had a quick question. Yes. It's just like a fun, because uh, I'm interested. How much could that like chain armor uh, weigh? Um, yeah, it, I mean, you know, it could, I don't know, a hundred pounds, a lot. It would weigh a lot. All of those things like the, the uh, Oh shoot! What did I, what did I call those guys? Um, you know, chainmail armor are all made of metal, so you're actually putting metal on top of the clothing that you're wearing. So that would be something interesting to look at and research. And maybe this is a time period that you want to look at for your um, for one of the historical comments. I'll make that note. Uh, I have a question uh, that's uh, unrelated. Uh, when is the midterm? So I the midterm is this week, and I oh. posted a midterm study guide, which we looked at, and I will have it up by midnight tomorrow. Um. So. Uh, and you'll it'll uh, be open for a week. It'll be open for me. Okay. All but right. remember, when you start working on it, then you're done working on it. Actually, I okay. think I'll have it end on, I think I said I was gonna end it on Sunday. So Sunday at midnight, it gives you the full weekend, uh, but 11.59 technically, uh, but it, you'll have for, we all have five days to work on it or five days to pick the day that you wanna work on it, okay? And remember, it. this is all listed on the guide. Mm -hmm. It is um, 30 multiple choice questions and three short answer questions, five points each. So that's all listed in your research in the, the guide. Okay. And it tells you exactly what's going to be on it. Okay, let's take a break. And I will see you back at 11.15 and we will do a uh, drawing. So bring your drawing paper and your color media. So this is from a collection of George Polyok at the Musée Larmac. And this is a picture of what was in the museum. So this is a museum pamphlet, okay? And there's all kinds of weaponry. There is I'll let me move this because it's easier to see against the background. There you go. Okay. But it, uh, you know, there, it comes with an exhibition dialogue of what you're looking at from what time period. And then there's some beautiful displays of armor in here that, you know, then 
since I saw it in person, I have a visual memory of it. And that's one thing is that when I go anywhere, I try to look at what's there and what can I learn from. There are books that are um, the feudal coats of arms and pedigree. This is the Hel Hel Roderick, Hel heraldric patterns that I was talking about before. So we on the back, you can see they're listed and you can look up the names of them and you can see what they would look like. And these are, they are redrawn, but it is an authentic redrawing. So it's an actual redrawing of the actual garment. And then you can see the shields of the different characters. Let me see if I can find Richard. That was Gilbert de Clare, 1230. Lord of Clare, Earl of Gloucester. So Richard should be right around here. And these are redrawings. Before there was Xerox and copying, we would go to the museum and we would do redrawings ourselves because we couldn't copy things. And then when you do redrawings of it, you really do learn every single item of, of the armor. And this would be even true, you could see things even in Los Angeles. I just, I didn't mark uh, Richard. I'm wondering if it's in, yeah, it's not in chronological. So let me see if it's in alpha. I haven't, I haven't done anything medieval for quite a while. So yeah, here we go. Member Plaginet, it's Henry Plaginet. Let's see, where are we? Well, I have marked this page, so this must have been, must have been important for me. So you can really check on the authenticity of each specific shield. So this one, you can think, oh, this is Richard the Lionheart, but it's not actually, it's just a take on it. And actually it's Robert Morley, okay? And Morley is probably on here. Uh, boar, Argent, Lion, Rampant, Sable, a label. So then we have things like Arms and Armor of the Western World which can give you a, um, a picture of something. So this is Bartholomeo Campi Passaro 1546. So that's too late for our particular period. And let's see what we have in earlier period, but it is a detailed picture of it. And it is hard to get um, in this time period of 1183 for sure. Here's a really interesting uh, falcon and hawk hood. Falconry was big then. So that's an image of a falcon, a stuffed falcon with the hood on. And the jaw straps that they use for those and other things that are with falconry. Let me see about the very earliest time. I'm going to go to the list of plates. Okay, so this is a sword of Palermo, which is before 1200. So this is an authentic piece that's still existing. Now, metal is going to exist far better than cloth or fiber because those disintegrate with wear. So many of your influences can be in metal pieces. Remember that enameled piece that we saw. So that's a sword. Here is a shield thought to have belonged to the Knight Arnold of Varennes. And again, you see the famous um, lion imagery. So that might give you some ideas. And then Medieval Costume, Armor, and Weapons, which I've had this book, which I was gifted a long, long, long time ago. And they have made it in a paperback. Okay. Again, it is mostly redrawings, but it is redrawings of a very 
high quality so that you can actually see um, what people might actually be wearing based on actual research. So let me go to our time period. Very limited. Okay, so you're going to get a few pieces, much less, there's just less information. But you know, that leaves more room for uh, more opportunity for invention. So uh, we're going to move over to so that we can work on our color media. Does everybody have theirs with them? Remember, you need, if you're working with water, you need two water devices. So we will, I'm just going to stop share so I can move this over to the other table where I have it set up. Okay, let me try and get the chat up so I can see all the media so that we make sure that we look at each piece. Okay. Colored pencils. Uh, those are, are you working with something like these or do they have movement? Are they watercolor pencils or they're just colored pencils? Okay, okay. And watercolor, when Otis, you say watercolor, are you talking about cake watercolor like this? Yes. Okay, good. Dry color acrylic tubes and color pencils. Okay, so oil pastels, they look like this. They're slightly different. Okay, we're gonna work with those. And acrylic, and are you working with tubs or tubes or squeezies? Cara and Josephine. Okay, little tubes. Let me go get my little tubes so that we can work with those as well. Wait, do you re is it okay to have those colored pencils or do you recommend? You can work with colored pencils. Um, but you mentioned like the movable, is that an important part of it for this? Oh, shoot. Sorry, I just threw water all over. Just a minute. We can, you can move with those uh, color pencils. I'll show you how to move them around. Just a minute. You can also layer them up. So the first thing I want you to do while I'm trying to clean up the swamp, I have made a swamp, is using two colors. Uh, let's mix to a, a tertiary color that's analogous. So um, that would mean I'm gonna work with the red and orange and get a color in between. So again, we can never forget our color wheel, right? So your color wheel is, I'll put them on this because this is cleanest. Here's your color pencils. We're gonna go red blue, that's not a good blue, yellow, orange, I don't like that green. You have to be careful with your colors that you're getting something that's really a true in-between instead of something that is um, not, okay? So what you're going to take your, your primary colors and you're going to work through those. So I don't actually have any kind of purple here. So that's good. Or magenta. That's excellent. That'll even out the playing field, won't it? Okay. So just for now, let's just get used to the colors and really get a good saturated whatever you can 
the best color that you can so that you really have it bright. Oh, oh that's handy. You know what, you know what this is for? If you're working with color pencils, you have to have a pencil sharpener. Because you'll break them a lot. Okay. So I'm working on the foam core, which is not the best. And I'm going to work with the side so I can get more color on. I'm working with this particular piece because it is stiff. And I want to hold it up for you. Okay. So let's see what happens if I put water on there. I'm going to have to mix to this purple because I don't have one. So I'm going to use a fairly big, it's a Chinese natural bristle brush. I'm going to always, always power up your brush and get it wet first. And then I'm going to get the space in between these two wet. I'm not working with a mobile pencil. Let's see if it, if it will move for me. And if it doesn't move, then what you have to do, it's moving. You can see that it's moving around a little bit. And then I can put my other color on top. I never knew you could do that. That's and amazing. And can I get, oh, I never know what I can do. I just keep trying to do stuff if I need to. You know, I never, I never, So then I look at it and am I getting, am I getting some kind of in between purple? Well, here's an interesting thing about this. I am getting a super great texture, which is very fun. And can I move it after the fact? A little, it's a little bit movable, but you know, if I want to try and move this, I'm not going to get that to bleed out anywhere. Unlike if I have a cake, which will now be all over the place. Um, I can move that. Now to work with a cake, I think we talked about this before, you have to power up the color by getting it wet and allowing it to sit in there. When you're working with tubes, you already have that advantage because the tube is going to permit, you have to get the tube and then you have to squeeze a little bit out and you have to put water with it. So I'm going to leave that over there. I'm going to get another brush for this piece. Remember, you always have two waters. You have your wash and your rinse. I even have a third one so that you can keep them clean. I'm going to pick red now. And let's see what we do with the same thing. These are quite dry. So I'm going to get enough water in here. Okay. You can see that I'm slight, very slightly agitating the surface. That's the thing you miss out on when you're doing digital. It's really, this, this gives you a lot of control. So let's put these next to. I'm not sure that's, I need a little bit more water, but I don't really want it. If I dip this in here, it's going to make, oh, I told you. Yep. See, it immediately makes it a color. But I'm going to, I need more water. And you have to really saturate to get a darker color. Because it's easy to get light color. Okay, that's not bad. Notice how this color, you'll, you'll get used to your color, but this color is much bluer than what is marked as red on the Crayola, okay? You can see that. This is a cooler tone, that's a warmer tone. Does that make sense to everybody, what I'm talking about? Let's see what the blue, how the blues match up. The blue is too wet. So one thing that I like to work with, I, it is too wet. I have to get a paper towel. I also work with a sponge too, to if you want to get things up. 
like, I don't like this thing right here. So I'm going to get it up. And sometimes you can pretty much, you know, wipe it away. This is too wet. So I'm going to get some of that liquid out of there. I overdid it. Um, may, may I suggest a, an idea um, uh, for like future classes? Um, sure, holler it out. Uh, maybe uh, maybe ahead of time um, you could uh, let let us know like uh, in that class period that um, we're going to need these materials out because I noticed that. Um, like I was gonna do painting right now, then realized I had to do that. I could do my colored pencils, and it took me a took me a while to go. Like I had to like I had to like kind of leave really quick, and uh, you, you know what? You know everything. that would be so ideal if I could do that. You're right. Mm -hmm. I'm trying my best. Okay. All so right. you know, this is a this is a like a lab workshop period, and mm -hmm. I I apologize that you don't get to have as much time as as you would have liked to have had it's so okay. one thing um about working with a brush is trying to get the brush to articulate as many different things as you can so you need to have a good point and then you need to you can have a very very thin line and you can have a thicker line based on how you how much pressure you put onto your brush Okay, so this is why when we draw from the mannequin, you'll be able to then make, you know, a skirt upside down. Shape based now on would we, we Would we actually be outlining with paints or would we be no. like filling in a wash of a color? Uh, there's good, you're gonna do all kinds of things. Okay. There's no one thing that's going to be the thing you're doing. Got it. So you're, you are going to have a sketch down there that you will be working with, right? And then you will try to look at your swatches and see how you can imitate your swatches on your paper. That would be ideal. And so just, just, start getting your things out and working with them. I talked about the Dr. Martin watercolors, so I just wanted to show you those for a second. They're this kind of a thing. They come in a tube. I mean, in a tin, I don't even know if they make them, but they're super saturated, but they're transparent and saturated. So they're just really kind of fun. And sometimes you can just find different kinds of things to, to play with. So this is one of those things then I'll just give you a, con a, um, a contrast so that you can see how this color is different than the other red color and the intensity of it. So I'll put it right here, just so that if you wanna get a more brilliant color, you might need a different me media. Not so much different than the, than the cake one, you know, really, that one's pretty cool. That's a pretty good one. But I can get it much darker as well. Okay, so start working with each one of your colors. Ideally, you would make a, a square so that you know what each one of your colors does. So if I'm going to work with my cake colors, well, I wish I could get that color. So this is, this is my wash, right? I just put that Dr. Martens in there and it's really vivid. This is why I'm doing a three color because it's still giving me liquid. Oh, you know what? That container is leaking. That's the problem. I wondered where the water went, whoops. adventures 
So yeah, I take your point, Diego. I think that would be ideal. I wish I was more organized. You did mention it last week, so this isn't completely out of the blue. Well, and also basically uh, uh, we, I think it might be also on your, um, definitely drawing is on your uh, site as well. So make a square for each color that you have in the most intense color possible so that you know, this is what I can get with this paint. And then mix it so that it is a wash. And maybe you can go from light to dark. But you want to do it with, with uh, a controlled water, OK? Because this is going to bleed. See how intense you can get it. And make a note, because when you want to use a specific color, you need to know what you have in your toolkit. Okay, so just try and figure it out by putting down, okay, this is red, and then mark it down with a pencil. Oh, now I've contaminated my clean water. Okay, so I got to go back. figure out which each one of your colors will do. Even if you're working with colored pencil, put them in rainbow order, okay? Rainbow order means the color spectrum. So you're gonna go from blue through purple to red to orange to yellow and all the colors in between. So I'm gonna do yellow here and I'll do orange in the middle. So if I have an orange I want to know exactly what I have. And I have a kit, so I do have an orange here, and I'm not going to have to, I'm not going to have to blend to that. So I put when I put yellow in with purple, it makes it muddy. See how much muddier it got? That was a beautiful color. Oh, I forgot to fill it up. So before we start working with rendering, you need to know what your colors do. Have you taken time to do that yet? I'm trying, I think my colored pencils are the type that work with water. So I'm just testing out how they work. Yeah, with test them out. And stuff. But also do your colors in the same way. So I'm going to just stop this watercolor thing for a second. And I'll do the pen color pencil, same way, right? Red. Uh, yeah, uh, when I dip it in water, I notice I'm only seem to probably get like a lighter color. Yeah. And if I try mixing it in with something yeah. else. It doesn't really that move. means it's moving. That's great. Oh. But I tried to mix it in with the red and it just kind of made this really dark, like, stark mix of blue and red. It didn't make like a purple or anything. Was... So for example, this orange pencil is not the best orange pencil, but it's good to know. And you should mark where it has a name on it right here. This is young orange and this is orange. This is going to be closer to this one. Put them so that you can tell what they are because when you're, when you're rendering, you're going to want to know exactly the color that you're working with. So you can see these are two slightly different variants. These are color pencils. Red to this orange to the young orange. Pam, can you do that again? Because I couldn't see it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, it was kind of quick. And I, I realized I. There you go. Okay. So this is my watercolor, just from cake, watercolor, cake, cake. And I, I need to go back and fill this in. This is too much water. This is color pencil, just in a square red. A, a deeper orange. I put this one in first. It, I felt like there must be something in between. I found this one. Now I'm going to look for something in between these two. And if not, maybe I can mix something in between with my, with my 
color pencils, okay? So that you get where each color represents on paper. Now I wanna go get some tubes so that for the last couple minutes, I can show you that. So keep working on this particular portion. Here's a yellow green and I go to a darker green. Is this just for the pencils or is it to, from the- What's that? Is that just for the pencil, the water? No, oh. you wanna do it if you're, whatever color you're working with. Okay, so this is an interest. I'm gonna put this on here and I'll talk about it in a second. Okay. So I thought this might be a brighter color, but this is a less saturated color. So I went from yellow to this younger green to green to blue. This color belongs over here because it's muddy, right? It's not as intense. And we need to know what every single color represents that we have, including black, white, and gray. How can you change those? So I know a couple of people said they didn't have black or white. Did you guys get them since we talked last time? Because you will need them. Yeah. Okay, perfect. I knew a costume designer. I, did I tell you this already? She, she's now deceased. She's really interesting. I worked with her once. And you know she had nine Academy Award nominations. But uh, when she made a mistake, she used whiteout. So white is really important to have, okay? I'm just gonna go get my tubes so that we can talk about acrylics and mixing acrylics. So please work on this little part of the one thing about, one thing about working with acrylic paint that you should know is although you can treat it like watercolor, it is opaque. So you can la actually paint on top of something with it. So a tube comes out and it's kind of gooey like that. You want to be able to put it in there and move it around with water. I generally do this on a piece of, of paper. So I can put my tube on like this and use, I'll pick that up. Oh, I thought I was putting it on this. Ugh, okay. Now it's on this. Okay, so this is acrylic. It is, has a greater opacity than watercolor and you can paint on top of something completely and hide it. You can also use it like watercolor. So I'm gonna wet my brush. My clean water is now tinged with pink. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, wipe my brush on a damp paper towel to make sure I'm not carrying anything with it. So this is, pretty viscous and it gives a really specific, nice, rich color, but I can color over anything with that color and hide it. So there's certain advantages to that. I can also make it a watercolor so that it can be transparent and then it won't hide over, okay? But one thing about watercolor that, that is a characteristic is even after it dries, if you wet it again, it will move. So I want you to know that because when you start rendering, if you think, oh, I need to go back in and touch that up and you use your wet brush, things will bleed, okay? And maybe you can use that to your advantage. You might get something much more interesting that way. But that's why I also say work with a couple of different copies of what you have so that you're not gonna wanna tear your hair out if something happens. But it is great to be able to overpaint something and completely obliterate it with another color, especially if it's dry. Or if you wanna put something inside of something else. then this will mask it 
and will not blend with it, okay? Particularly if you're keeping it quite dry, meaning I'm not putting, I'm not treating it like a watercolor, I'm not wanting it to move around. Because if I want it to move around, it, even on, this is my crayon, even on my crayon, uh, sorry, colored pencil, I say that because they're Crayolas. I mean, it's a kind of a cool effect. So part of it is you have to allow yourself enough time to play and come up with some happy accidents. If you've never painted before, just try to enjoy it. Just try to think, what color is it? Uh, class is technically over, but one thing I'd like you to think about right now is Try to mix to your flesh tone. Whatever flesh tone you are. So I'm pretty tan, right? So I'm gonna try and mix to tan, but I'm the reason why I'm thinking that is this is not so bad. It's a little pink. So if I went in there with this, with this uh, yellow okra, I might get a flesh tone on there. Maybe I need a little more water. One thing, sometimes what I do is I just go in and put the flesh tones on first so I feel like I'm working with a human. Not bad. So you might wanna try that. Mix to a flesh tone, see if you can find a flesh tone. My guess is it's gonna be, you know, it'll have some either yellow or pink base. You're gonna to need to possibly do some white but when you do that, mix it in a container so that you have enough so that you can paint uh, one or two characters with it and just do their faces. That, that's my worst problem is I create these colors and then I run out of that color. Yep. And, and it's very I hard to recreate that. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And that's a practice thing and you'll get better. You'll definitely get better. I'd find my pink. Here we go, this one maybe. So think about what color that's gonna be. Not that one. Or what color is gonna mix with that to give me a flesh tone. And it's a really interesting, you know, it depends on if you're yellow tone underneath, brown tone, pink tone, but practice creating a flesh tone. So each one of your colors and then try and create a flesh tone. Could be very interesting with your uh, color pencils, you guys. And then next time I have some beautiful color pencil renderings, I'll show you so that you know that you're not at a disadvantage, okay? So next time we'll hopefully have our guest speaker, but we'll definitely be drawing from a mannequin. I'll be setting up a mannequin and uh, we will draw both male and female and I'll get some garments that are resembling what you may be drawing so that you can practice that in a lab. So try and get some, uh, if you're thinking about what kind of paper you want to use, or if you have a sketch paper, work on that, okay? So for next time, Diego, have your paper ready, have your drawing ready, ready to draw my mannequin in at least eight to 12 inches and your color media. Okay. All right. Um, is the assignment you, to do the, the squares? Like what's the assignment for the lab? I guess I'm not quite understanding. Today's like, what... lab assignment is to identify each one of your colors. Uh huh. And label them? By name. Got it. And create a flesh tone. Okay. Okay. Yes. That's the lab. I'll type it up right now. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for clarifying. But I was just wanting, because Diego said that and it was totally valid. I just wanted to um, reiterate what we'll be using for uh, next time. Is nine to 12 in okay? What does that mean? Inch, yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. You're talking about the size of the figure. Uh, if you have a 12 inch page, you're probably gonna do an eight to nine inch figure, but nothing less than eight. We need to have enough volume so that we can see what we're looking at okay so get us a piece of paper that you like you could do two on this one this happens to be a large size you could do two more like this 
this is two on here. And I'll also post the Ashland site for you. So I'm posting five books. I'm gonna see if we can get them online from uh, the museum. I'll post the Ashland site on the same resource books that'll be under resources and research, and then I'll post the lab. Good. Let's see, what else do we have? Yes, thank you. Of course. Is that all for today? That's all, that's oh, okay. all. Sure, you wanna submit your drawing on Canvas, absolutely. I'll see you. Bye, thank you. Bye, thank you. Thank you.